Welcome. I'm Faye Waterman. I'm the Conversation Curator. And today my guest is the beautiful Katie Gordon. And Katie is the creator of Dietless Living. Now, welcome, Katie, and thank you for your time. Hello, Faye. Thanks for having me on the show. It's so great to be here today. It's beautiful to have you. Now, Katie, you have a little bit of a story to tell of how you've gotten to where you are today. Let's share some of the experiences that you've had of weight loss and how you've become the the guru, I'm going to say, of dietless living and why you call it dietless living. Now, that's a very good question, Faye. Thank you for asking that. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that one before. Well, I had a weight problem and we'll call it a chronic weight problem was 25 years between putting on weight and working out how to get rid of it permanently. I could lose weight, but I could never keep it off. Sometimes I kept it off for, you know, a couple of years, but therein lied the problem was why does I why do I just keep putting the weight back on and it was just a very arduous 25 years of trying to work out what that was and you know I spoke to loads and loads of people I just I couldn't find any real answers everyone kind of had an answer but it sort of turned out that they all had one piece of a puzzle and dietless living is actually that puzzle come together And what dietless living actually means is exactly what it says, living life diet-free. So not focusing in on what you eat, you know, per se. It's the real crutch of the matter is getting out and living life and the rest of things take care of themselves. There's a few other bits and pieces in there, but essentially... We have to get out and live a life. When we're very unhappy and stressed, that's where this these eating behaviours come in and then, you know, the the challenge of overcoming or, or moving beyond a, a learned behaviour, that's what our real problem is and that's where the living part comes in and helps us to do that. Very interesting. You've said a few very interesting things there. Uh, it's the habits, it's the stress-related eating that, that people do. If I get stressed, I couldn't think of anything worse than eating food. But I know that a lot of people eat food for comfort when they're unhappy and they're stressed. And also looking at the word diet. Diet is something that I see as you do every day of your life. It's not something you go on to lose weight it is all about healthy eating. It is all about changing your eating habits, your lifestyle to fit in with what you do and make it so that you enjoy, enjoy food and never go without the things that you really like, but have them in moderation. And what you're doing is teaching people to recognize that a diet isn't something that you have to starve yourself and you see other people eating something and you're thinking, oh, gosh, I'd like some of that. It's about you looking at who you are as an individual and saying, I feel good about myself and I eat this food and then I have some of this every now and then. It's allowing, isn't it? It is allowing, and I often say of myself now, is that I eat anything I like, but not everything I want. That's a good analogy, eating anything you like, but not everything you want. Yes. And it's changing those eating habits, isn't it? It's all about looking at the foods that that we eat as individuals and as families and educating ourselves to say well okay is this really healthy for me is this doing me giving me the energy or is it giving me brain fog because a lot of foods will give you brain fog exactly which compounds the problem because then you feel bad and then your brain goes I need something else you know I need a pick-me-up so then we have more 
rubbishy foods because when we want to pick me up, it's strange our mind doesn't go, gosh, I'm really lethargic, I need something, I'll have some fruit. Has a brain never said, right? It always says I need chocolate or whatever. And I think a part of that really comes from the saturation of marketing since you're born, which is, you know, have uh, any chocolate ad, any ice cream ad, any ad about any food that actually isn't good for you comes with images of sparkling people, you know, outside connection, happiness, pick me up, you know, they're not sitting around overweight, lethargic on a couch. So our mind is looking for something to pick us up. And the images that it's been soaked with over life is, you know, chocolates and whatever. So naturally, that's the image that it goes for, that's it. And of course, you know, we've had the experience of sugar, our brain loves it, we lean into it, we smile, yay, that tastes so good. So we're getting all the mechanisms happening inside that says, yes, tick, that's good for us, I want that now, I feel bad, I want that. So there's quite a few things going on, but it'd be lovely if when we got, you know, feeling uh, the afternoon slump or whatever, that we went, gosh, I really want a piece of fruit, you know, that would be nice. Or maybe I'll actually go and have a nap because that's really what my body wants to do. And be kind to yourself. It's it's all about being kind to yourself. It's not about, oh, I've got to do that. It's telling your brain that I would love to do that. I would love to have that piece of fruit or I'd love to go and have that nana nap for 20 minutes in the afternoon and not feel guilty about doing that. I think it's about nurturing our bodies and being kind to ourselves and not worrying about what everybody else thinks. It's yep. You've got to be concerned about who you are and as long as you're not hurting anyone else, do the right thing for you so that you live a healthy and happy life. And you feel much happier when you're not lethargic, when you're not feeling stressed. Take yourself out into the fresh air. As we were having yes. the conversation earlier, go out into that fresh air when it's cool and it's crisp and it, you breathe it in and it makes you feel wonderful, even though it is cold. I know we need that change of scenery. And this is the thing, you said a very important thing there about being kind to yourself. Sometimes people, I know I did, mistook being kind to myself as having that chocolate. So, you know, sometimes you go, oh, damn it, this is the conversation in the head, right? Damn it, I'm working so hard, I deserve something now like and it always is I deserve and it's like okay do what do I really deserve becomes the better conversation do I deserve that chocolate and whatnot but the conversation is with ourselves being kind with ourselves is doing like you and I are doing now having a conversation with ourselves about where we're at, what's going on, and, well, why do you want the chocolate? Is there something better we could have at the moment? What else, you know, what is it that we really want to do? And having a better rapport with ourselves because basically our unconscious mind's like our naughty friend that goes, yay, it's Friday, let's go to the pub. And you go, yay, it's Friday, let's go to the pub. <laughs> so true, isn't it? Because everyone that works and they're in the offices before COVID, they flocked to the pubs. Now, after COVID, they're flocking back to the pubs and they're drinking and eating crappy food and doing all that sort of stuff. And you've just brought something to me, Friday. It's Friday. Yay, it's Friday. I can have a wine. Oh, I can have wine and chocolate or I can have wine and chips. Or beer and pizza or whatever. It's these things that are linked to happy times on a Friday. And we have many moments of that through the week. That's where all those little chocolate moments are or whatever your, your thing is. And it's about having better conversations with ourselves about what we're doing and where we're going and really because we're trying to get to that. Like our, our, our mind is working in three different parts. I teach the three systems of uh, health consciousness. And our mind, we're, we're trying to go to the same place. We're just 
trying to go different ways. And the one that's winning is the one that has been running the show the longest, which is our unconscious mind. And it's the one that goes, yeah, chocolate, chocolate's fast. Let's do chocolate. Let's do it now. But the chocolate just gives you this high for a few minutes and then all of a sudden the sugar rush is gone and you're back to where you started. And And it hasn't resolved any problems at all. (laughs) Not at all. And I'm just thinking about, you know, when I was growing up, we lived across the road from a shop and I was constantly at that shop. I I reckon I bought it. And (laughs) (laughs) it's really funny what you're, you're making me remember. But it is habit and you know, working in the fitness industry and seeing people, you know, going up and down on with their weight and being obsessive about fitness when they don't need to be obsessive, being obsessive about the amount of food they eat when they have to be kind to themselves. We, you know, we, we're we in this world where it's rush, 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 and everything has to happen now and not later. And looking at Being you, take a look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, I am beautiful. I have all that I need here right now. I don't need to go looking for that shiny object. I don't need to go and have that that food that's fatty and horrible to make me feel better. I can have a glass of water or I can have a beautiful meal of of steam veggies and a piece of fish or a piece of red meat whatever it is just be kind to yourself be allowing that's actually one of the things I say too is when we go on a diet like we're already living a tight life somebody who's overweight and I speak from my own experience when we're overweight our body's restricted our mind's restricted because we're constantly feeling that restriction in our body we are without a doubt generally leading some kind of a restrictive life. We've got too many things, too many plates in the air, and we're just living a very tight life. We're not, you know, because we wouldn't really have a problem, hence why it's called dietless living. If we were out enjoying and relaxing and connecting with people. So we're living these very tight lives And then our mind says, right, today's the day I'm losing weight. And we go on a diet and an exercise program or whatever, and we tighten it down even more because we cut out foods. We add in more things to a very tight schedule. You know, the many um, sessions at the gym, whatever we're going to do, cooking special meals. Now, if we were good at cooking meals for ourselves, we probably wouldn't be putting on the weight because, you know, that takes time. So we're tightening, 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 and eventually that undoes itself. When the reality is what we need to do is start to loosen up our life. And loosening up our life starts by loosening up our mind. You know, we've got to start to break that all apart, those restrictions that we have in there, so that we can break apart some of these learned behaviours so that we can start doing things differently and then other things out in our life will start to shift. That's being really kind to ourselves. Yes, and it just makes so much sense. I think as society, I think we're competing with ourselves and not only ourselves but life. Yes. and others and we're worried about someone judging us but if someone's judging us they're judging themselves really because they see something in you that they don't like in themselves yeah and as far as cooking food and things you know it it's cheaper to go and buy fresh food than it is to buy processed foods and I don't care what anyone says I know Processed food costs a lot. It's the packaging. It's all the crap that's in the processed foods and things. Go buy yourself fresh veggies. You don't need a lot of them and a piece of meat. You don't have to eat it all the time. You know, there's lots of ways that you can cook. And if you can't cook, find someone who will inspire you to cook the things that you like. And you know, as I said, being in the fitness industry and seeing people go from 
having a fabulous body to an anorexic or a bulimic body and watching them and there is not a thing you can do, yep. not a thing you can do for them. But just, you know, exercise, a little bit of exercise. You don't have to go and pound yourself away in the gym. You can walk and you can increase the intensity of the walk and you can get just the same results and you're not pounding your body. You know, yep. it, it's all about balance that balance and not going to the gym every day you don't need to go to the gym every day you can go every second day give your body a rest and eat the right foods but also have what you crave for but in a moderation yeah and understand the the foods that are your trigger foods you know we all have foods that were one's too many and a hundred's not enough so there's a there's some foods to just go basically with dietless living, I teach you how to outgrow food because I there was foods that I just could not resist and foods that I once I started on them, I'd just be like an eating machine, this hand-to-mouth thing. You know, it was just like a perpetual me- uh, wheel. It just wouldn't stop. And it was... It was that that kind of eating that used to be like, why? Why can I not stop this? Or how do I stop this? You know, I, I asked everybody, I looked around. But the secret is how to let yourself outgrow those habits so that when it comes, like you're saying, you can have a little bit of it. But really the reality comes down to being indifferent to a lot of those foods and going well it's just a cake it there's nothing special about it it's that this pull in the mind for most people with a chronic weight problem like I had this this pull in the mind that we cannot just have a piece without sort of setting off some um, dominoes fall that leads us to places we don't want to go and the constant resisting doesn't work either because it's just going to fatigue at some point and you're going to give in. And then, you know, for me, I used to be like a locust on a wheat field. It was just, <laughs> and it was like, well, how do I break this? How do I stop this? And it wasn't just one food that it was with, you know, it would be with all kinds of foods and it would be, um, with our alcohol you know you get to Fridays and it was like yippee you know just let's have as much as we want to have and it was just building in I just I thought about it so many years like for so many years what is going on and how do I stop it and it came down to I just want to be indifferent to it I want to see it and go it's like a beautiful flower I can appreciate its colour, its form, its texture, its aroma, but I don't want to eat it. And that's what food has to become. And then there's the food that you want to eat, you know, that you haven't maybe been eating enough of, the fruits and the veggies and, you know, those nice foods and how to increase the desire for those and as you become more indifferent to that. What was the... The the place in your life or the time in your life, when was it that you decided that something really has to change? You were, you'd gone through, you'd asked, you'd been here, there, and everywhere, and everyone was giving you advice, but nothing was changing. What was it that broke the back to make you change and bring you to where you are today, not only helping yourself? but also helping others to realise that they need to be kind to themselves. I can tell you exactly where that moment was. Uh, In 2010, I had become very depressed. I did a lot of depression over the years because of failed weight loss. Like it was very devastating. Um, And in 2010, I, by the September of 2010, I actually was thinking about going on a road trip at Christmas time. Like my my focus was there and I wanted to go for a drive with no plan. Um, and I was contemplating just being a missing person. I was very unhappy with everything. And I thought, I'm just, 
I just can't change anything. I'm not getting anywhere with this. And so the idea just was formulating in my mind. I told my then partner, you know, this is what I'm going to be doing as we're getting closer to Christmas. And I said, and you're not coming. I'm just going to go on my own. I, I don't have a plan. I'm I'm going to, if I, you know, can't get accommodation, I'll, I'll just sleep in the car. I don't care. I'm just not having a plan. Because like I said, I'd been living a very tight life. And um, he sort of knew something was not quite right because he went, well, that doesn't sound anything like you, Katie, because, you know, I was so very rigid at planning everything. And I think he had an inkling that, you know, there was something going on in the background. He probably didn't realise I was thinking about being a missing person, but he knew something was not right. And in the end, I said, you can come, but you cannot have a say about anything. Like, this is my holiday. So we went got to New Year's Eve, um, we found ourselves in Mudgee, a little town, you know, uh, inland town, and this part of me that wanted freedom was saying, let's just go out and enjoy New Year's Eve in Mudgee, you know, and went to this little local pub and I wanted to chat to the locals and sort of had a little chat to this one person. He went, you know, because I said, hey, what happens in Mudgee on New Year's Eve? And he went, oh, well, stay away from that end of town. That's where all the rat bags are. You know, up here is where us older sensible folk are. <laughs> and so my partner and I, we we went out to dinner at some Chinese restaurant or something, and, and I said, oh, what are we going to do? And he went, well, you heard the dude. He said, there's going to be rat bags. Like, we don't want to be out in that. And I was thinking to myself, we used to be the rat bags. Like, you know, we used to be young and having a good time. And I allowed his fear to couple in with mine. And we both went back to the very unattractive motel room with a bag of chocolate and, and beer. And that was New Year's Eve. And I cried myself to sleep going, like this was my moment where I'm meant to break free and here I am. And so New Year's Day 2011, I woke up at 5 a.m. as I would and I was just so miserably depressed with myself about I can't break free. I don't know what to do. I'm never going to be able to break free from my weight, my my lifestyle, how I'm living and I went out to the pool. I had my hula hoop. I always have my hula hoop. And I was just kind of hula hooping and, you know, mulling over my life, my options, thinking about all the things I'd done and seen. I'd seen a lot of things. I'd seen a lot of, like you were saying, people who exercise themselves like maniacs, but they're still having health problems and whatnot. And I just went, screw the lot. I'm probably going to be fat forever. I'm just going to be happy. I haven't been happy for one minute, hardly. And so I'm going to take everything I know and everything I've learned and all the stuff I've tried that actually worked to reduce my anxieties, reduce my stress, give me happiness, freedom, all of this stuff. It was just like this big pot of things. I'm just going to have a year of happy. And it was in my year of happy. And, you know, it's hard to be happy when you've been practicing unhappiness for so long because our brain's just not wired for happy. So it was about I'm going to still have the same job, I'm going to have the same relationships, I'm going to have the same health problems. I'd been having three migraines a week for 20 years. I'd been having, you know, fibromyalgia, I had terrible gut problems, Um all kinds of problems that I just I hadn't been able to get rid of. Dong, these things are my life, so how am I going to be happy? And so I just employed these ideas, these strategies, and started working my life. And that year, which is the year I call my year of relief, was the turning point, just that change of focus, hence dietless living, focused on living, being happy in amongst the chaos of my life. Nothing changed. I had to change. 
But when I changed, everything else changed as well. And so by the end of the year, those, all those migraines had stopped. The digestive problems had stopped. The fibromyalgia was uh, resolved, as in went into whatever remission it does. And I'd lost 20 kilos. And it's like, okay, well, I was having waffles with maple syrup and cream many nights. How does that happen? Like, you know, I it just is this strategies of being happy, choosing happiness. Now, choosing happiness sounds like such a weird thing to say, you know, like how do you be happy in times of stress and strife? And that was the challenge was how to do that and outgrow these foods. Okay, so these foods, I want to be indifferent to them. How am I going to do that? And then, you know, I lost that weight and everything changed. I didn't instantly start teaching other people. I just went, well, that's really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> like I'm going to watch that for a while and see how I go. And I didn't have it relapse for six years. And I took myself off and I did a lot of different things to test my own resolve, my anxieties. And I thought, well, this actually works. I can teach other people. Beautiful. And it's a it's a realization. It's an allowing yourself to be happy instead of being unhappy. And that is a choice. And we all have choices to choose to change things in our life that aren't serving us. There are certain things that we can't change, but there are lots of things that we can change. And we have a choice to do that. And what you did was choose to be happy. And once you chose to be happy, your life started to change and evolve into something else. And all those stresses and illnesses and migraines and whatever you had disappeared. But I think what happens when we're unhappy, we just hold on to those things because they're security. But when we realise that they're not serving us, and we let go of them, we see something completely different. And what you're doing now is because you have experienced all these things, you're now educating other people and sharing how to do that with them so that they can be happy. They can lose all that stress and that anxiety. They can choose to do it, but they have to choose to do it. Yes. It's a, it's a it's a lot of different philosophies as well that I use because I studied a lot of different things. You know, you've got to come to your beliefs. You've got to come to acceptance. You've got to come to thinking about your future in a different way. You've got to um, re-educate yourself and rebuild your relationship with food. And with the present moment, you know, mindfulness is a lovely thing, but I actually prefer to follow the, the like the way of the Tao and the Tao Te Ching. And, you know, what really became clear to me was I'd been sitting in the waiting room of life, you know, waiting for when this thing happens or that's over or I can whatever, and then I'll be happy. And that, of course, never happens because it's not how a human life rolls. And it was this, okay, how do I be happy working with these people that I feel are unpleasant to work with, that are making my life challenging? And then and then, what it really came down to was this three systems of consciousness that I developed to explain it all is we're living in one state of mind, which is objectifying everybody, which means everybody is outside of ourselves and kind of the enemy is how our brain sees things. And then going, okay, well, if I'm not objectifying them, then I have to be humanizing them. And so if they're a human being that I'm working with and I'm struggling with them, what are they struggling with? probably the same shit that I'm struggling with, right? Our emotional states and how we think and feel about everything. And so if I'm not misbehaving, because I know I had a lot of unpleasant behaviours that were impacting other people, 
So if I don't think I'm misbehaving, then perhaps they're not misbehaving either. And how can I just kind of maybe I don't have to put up with things that don't agree with me, but I can allow them to be a human being and have their human experience. And perhaps we can co-create in this way. I, I'd been a horticulturist for 10 years and I, I love systems, you know, the systems of life. I'd studied naturopathy. I understand the systems of the body. And I, I just started to come to this idea that everywhere is a micro system. You know, I'm in a micro system at home. I'm in a micro system at work. Every time I go to the shops, the traffic, they're all systems. And I've got to work out how to fit into each one instead of making all of them try and fit me. And okay. there really was the, the piece. I loved what you said just a while ago is that you were sitting in the waiting room of life. Now, we have to finish in, in a moment, but I love that analogy of sitting in the waiting room of life and how many people are actually sitting there waiting for you, Katie Gordon, to support them through the processes that they need to go through to get them to the other side where they actually want to be. So if there's anyone out there in that waiting room of life and thinking, what's out there, what's next, connect with Katie, have that conversation with her because she may just say one thing that actually changes your life forever. Now, Katie, what's one tip that you can give to people listening to this in what they can do to look at where they are in their life and do they ask, get them to ask the question, do I actually want to change it or am I so comfortable here that I want to stay here? One question to ask. Well, maybe that goes back to what we were talking about before our show started, Faye, sitting in our comfy spot in the, you know, where we're all warm and toasty from the cold and we don't want to move because we know it's going to be cold out there. So ask yourself, how can I go against every natural instinct, which is telling me to stay here with my warm blanket on and go out and do something different and see what that feels like? Beautiful. How can they get in contact with you, Katie? Um, my website is all the W's, katiegordon.me, um, and LinkedIn is a very good platform for connecting with me if you want to connect with me there. Beautiful. Thank you, Katie. I loved having that conversation with you. It was very informative and enlightening. And if anyone is in the waiting room of life, just stop and think about having that conversation with Katie. Connect with her on LinkedIn or go to her website. Katie Gordon. Thank you, Katie. I'm Faye Waterman. This has been a conversation with Faye. Thank you, Faye. Thank you. And it's bye from me for now.